Great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, and welcome to our professional networking um, workshop and also showcase, virtual showcase. Um, before we get started, uh, my name is Yandy Reynoso, um, and I am an advisor for Education USA in Mexico City. Um, and also, um, we have in the audience um, some a higher education institutions that will be participating during this event. Uh, before I introduce them, um, in the audience, we also have Magali Hernandez, who is also an advisor for Education USA in Mexico City. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, we suggest you, you keep your microphones in off. Um, you are welcome to turn on your camera so we can see you. Um, and also at the end, we'll have some questions. Uh, time, sorry, for Q&A. Uh, make sure you uh, type those in the chat. And before we start with our workshop, um, we're going to start talking a little bit about what is what Education USA is. So we are a Department of State network uh, of over 430 international student advising centers in more than 175 countries and territories. Our network promotes uh, US higher education to students around the world by offering accurate, comprehensive, and current information about the different opportunities available to you to study at an accredited institutions in the US. We are your official source on US higher education. Um, so all of our services and activities, such as workshops like this one, webinars, personalized um, sessions are free of charge. Uh, if you're interested in learning a little bit more about our services and our activities, we recommend you get in contact with your closest Education USA Advising Center by, visit, by visiting our official website. We also have about 23 advising centers just in Mexico. So if you happen to be uh, in, in, in other parts of Mexico, uh, besides Mexico City, uh, you can visit the website that you see on screen so you can get in contact with your closest advising center. So whether you plan to pursue a short term or full degree program in the United States, Education USA has the resources you need in your five steps to US studies. And you can learn more about these five steps at our official website, educationusa.state.gov. And um, before we start, get started with the, the showcase, um, here with us, we have representatives, as I said, from um, Iowa State University. We also have a representation from Texas Tech University. Uh, we also have um, University of Texas at Austin. We also have Northeastern University and we also have Towson University. So each of these universities will be taking the time to cover the part of the, of the workshop. And first, we are going to be hearing from Karen, who is from Career Services at Iowa State University. She's going to be talking about um, what is professional networking and why it's important. Thank you, Taryn, for joining us, and the time is yours. Perfect. Hello, everybody. I'm so excited to talk a little bit with you um, today about professional networking. I work with students every single day. So I work with undergraduate students, graduate students, and alumni of Iowa State University. Um, and they come to me with questions about searching for internships and searching for jobs. And every single day we talk about professional networking and how very, very important it is um, to their futures and then to also to your futures. So we're gonna dive into it a little bit more today, tonight. Um, we can go to the next slide. But first of all, I just kind of wanted to define what is networking for you. So this can be a really overwhelming concept to a lot of people, not just students. I think for people in general, it can be very overwhelming to think about networking. Um, it feels like something that is sort of unobtainable or it's very scary. And so 
I like to describe it to students as it's a two-way process. So you don't have to feel like it's just you out there um, kind of doing the work, trying to establish this relationship and asking for things or asking for help. It's really a two-way relationship. So you want to be keeping that in mind as you think about um, starting these connections. And you probably already have many connections, but as you develop them and maintain them, um, keep in mind that it is a two-way relationship. Um, some of the reasons why you want a network are because you will have connections, you will have assistance in relating to your career exploration. So whether you know exactly what you wanna do or not, um, other people can be really helpful in that process. And it's mutually beneficial. So like I said, it's not just you asking for help, you also have experiences and skills and tools and knowledge that you can offer to other people. I always break it down for my students as two things, just being friendly. So being able to communicate with other people, um, being interested in what they have to say, asking them good questions, getting to know them. And then the other part of it is maintaining a positive professional reputation. So making sure that whatever you do, whether it's academic work or a part-time job or an internship or a graduate assistantship someday, um, you always do your best and maintain that positive reputation. So I think it really takes both of these parts to be successful in networking, that people think good things about you and they think about your work and you're also friendly and take the time to get to know other people. And we can go to the next slide. So one of the reasons that networking is so, so very important is that you need to be able to find opportunities. And another question I ask students a lot is what percentage of job seekers do you think find their jobs through networking activities? Um, and a lot of students will guess things like, oh, maybe 10% or maybe 20%, because um, there's a lot of kind of preconceived notions out there or myths about how people actually find their jobs. But if we go to the next slide, I put a little bit of a breakdown in how people actually find them. So in the United States, according to the US Bureau of Labor Statistics, studies estimate that actually 60 to 85% of people found their jobs through networking. So there are a lot of opportunities that are not always posted online, um, that they might not always run formal searches to find people to fill roles. Um, so a lot of people actually find their jobs through networking. So they already know someone, they find someone um, who tells them about an opportunity and that's kind of how they get involved in the process. Really only 10 to 13% of jobs are found through the formal job postings that we think about. And 2% of people found their jobs just randomly through sending out resumes. So you can see just in the instance of finding jobs, how networking is super important because so many opportunities are found through networking. Um, a couple other things that I think when I speak to our students, they find really interesting is that a lot of companies, um, especially bigger companies have referral programs for their employees. So if their current employees refer someone and they, for a job and they end up being a good match, that employee actually might get a little bit of money for that referral. And so kind of like I was talking about it, it can be a very mutual beneficial, um, mutually beneficial relationship um, to make those referrals, to have those connections. Um, you know, a lot of people as they're searching for jobs, they tell other people they're searching for jobs. They ask other people if they know about anything. And really that is very helpful in finding opportunities. And it's not only jobs, it can be a variety of other things. Um, but just those connections can be really, really helpful. I always think of it too as if I needed someone um, to do a job for me in my house. Um, so I might need someone to help me take care of my landscaping at my home. I am not as likely to just go online and try to find somebody to do that for me. I'm more likely to maybe ask my neighbors, hey, do you know anybody who does landscaping? 
I'm more likely to go ask my coworkers, do you know anyone who does landscaping? I want to get a referral because I'm going to be more comfortable if I know someone else who knows this person or knows that they do a good job. That's basically the way it works for any job you can think of is that people are going to talk, people are going to give referrals, they're gonna name the names of people who they already know. So again, networking is super, super important. We can go to the next slide. So I've kind of been talking a little bit about this. I think there's one back, there's one in between. Um, kind of touched on this a little bit, but leads to networking, leads to opportunities, connections increased visibility. So sometimes there are opportunities you don't even know about. And somebody again knows your name, gives that referral. Um, mentorship can be very helpful. So just having someone in your life who can tell you about helpful skills and experience and tools, give you advice um, and knowledge. So telling you like, hey, you should think about this, or maybe you need to do this. Networking can lead to all of these things. It can also be really helpful learning about the day-to-day -day of a job. Um, I have students sometimes who are maybe interested in a type of career, but they don't know a lot about it. So I have a lot of students interested recently in user experience, and they've heard of it before, but they're not really sure what it is. And so one of the things that we'll advise is that they start networking with other people who are already in that career to learn more about what that job actually is and what real people who already do the job have to say about it. Uh, you can also learn information about interviews that you might have coming up. So if you know somebody who already works at that organization, they can tell you a little bit about what that interview might be like and what you need to be prepared for. And then again, referral for future opportunities. So. As we're kind of establishing here, networking is one of the most important things that you can do for your future and for your career. Now we can go to the next slide. So I wanted to bring up some networking myths because I find that there are a lot of things that make people uncomfortable about networking or things they think that um, really stop them from doing a good job when they are networking. So that first one, you should only network when you're actively looking for a job or for an opportunity, which this is completely false. You need to make sure that you are networking and collecting those connections, you know, as you go through basically your entire adult life. So if it's time that you need a job and you're just starting to network, it's probably too late um, because you need to establish that professional reputation and that friendliness with people to kind of have a little bit of a track record that you um, are a reliable and trustworthy person. So always make sure that you start early. Uh, the second one, networking is selfish and pushy. Like I said in the first slide, it is a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, one thing that I advise is if you have a new connection that or an existing connection that you want to make sure that you keep in your professional network, one thing you should do is check in with them three times a year. So this will help them um, help you stay on their radar, help them stay on your radar, um, keep that connection kind of warm, as they say. So a good connection for you, a solid connection. Um, and ways you can do this might be just by establishing a time to chat with them on the phone and catch up, see how they're doing, um, having a time to do a Zoom call and ask them questions, see how they're doing. Or it could just be maybe you find an interesting article or online tutorial um, and sharing that with them too. So as you can see, all of those things, they might be helpful to you because they're, you're keeping that connection warm, but they're also helping them because you're giving them some information. Um, networking can only happen at formal events. No, it can happen at any, basically any event where you can meet a new person that can be networking. Networking is only for extroverts. It doesn't always have to be, um, you know, in person. It doesn't, you don't have to be an extrovert, like I said, to be friendly and to have a good working reputation. So it's for more than extroverts. It's for everybody. And then that final one, your friends and family are definitely part of your network. So you already have people in your network who can help you, who you can talk to about things you might have going on. Of course, it's good to also have other professionals outside of your friends and family um, in your network, but this is a great place to start is just jotting down your friends and family 
um, to be thinking about how they might be able to help you or how you might be able to help them. So you probably already have a great network. And then my final slide, just kind of wrapping things up, um, just keeping in mind that opportunities to network can happen at any time. So making sure that you are always being, that you are always prepared. So kind of going back to that last slide, it doesn't always have to be a formal opportunity. It doesn't always have to be with the most important person. Um, you can get great leads really from anyone. So with that, I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about some fantastic networking tools like your elevator pitch and LinkedIn. And those are really important parts of this networking puzzle. So I'm gonna wrap it up there and hand it off or hand it back to my, um, our host for the evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren and Iowa State from, for this great introduction of our workshop. Uh, now we are going to be talking about how to construct an elevator pitch. And we have Abby from Texas Tech University. Thank you so much, Abby, for being here today. Um, and the time is yours. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Abby Hill. Like she said, I'm the assistant director of recruitment for the grad school here at Texas Tech. This presentation was sent to me through our career center at Texas Tech University, and it's going to be short and sweet, just like an elevator pitch should be. So we can get started. So first of all, what is an elevator pitch? So a perfect elevator pitch, it allows you in 60 seconds or less to tell someone about yourself, your product or your idea in an interesting and memorable way. So um, job candidates can use this tool to introduce themselves to hiring managers or recruiters offering a quick overview of who they are and what kind of role they seek. Um, sale, sales professionals and entrepreneurs can also use this tool to sell their products and services. It's just a quick summary of yourself. It's a way to sell yourself. You can go on the next one. So first of all, elevator pitches, why are they important? So you can go to the next slide. So um, it is a great icebreaker to start a conversation. It tells you who you are, your background, and what type of job you are looking for. It also helps in answering, tell me about yourself, and also what to include in a cover letter. Some things to include in a perfect elevator pitch would be um, a problem. So explain the problem that you can solve as a professional or with your product or service. Solution. Once you've defined the problem, you can explain your solution. And then your unique, unique selling proposition. So highlight what makes your product, service, or candidacy different from the competition. You also need to include a hook. So this will make a memorable statement to capture your audience attention at the end. For example, you might emphasize the profits their business can make by using your product or hiring you as a candidate. You can go to the next slide. So getting into how to write an elevator pitch, you can go to the next one. So like I said, um, you can start off by who you are. So start off with an introduction. Um, so near the beginning of your elevator pitch, deliver one sentence about who you are. So mention your full name and occupation. So for example, you might introduce yourself as a sales representative for a specific company or a consultant for small to medium sized business owners. If you're a student, you could clarify your major and name the school you attend. Um, you also need to explain what you do. So give a brief summary of your background. So uh, write one or two sentences about what you do and the specific problem you solve. So if you're a job candidate, highlight your professional abilities and area of expertise. If you're in advertising an idea, explain the idea and why it's important. Also focus on the benefits you provide and how you impact the lives of others. Also, what do you want? Ask for what you want to happen next. So. State what makes you different. Write down what distinguishes yourself from competitors. If you're endorsing a product, service, or company, reference how it meets the consumer's needs. If you're a job candidate, write about the experiences, um, competencies, or credentials that make you unique as a candidate. And also, um, what are you wanting to do? Like, basically, why are you pitching yourself to them? Okay, you can do the next one. So like I said, you have to take a few minutes to write your elevator pitch. So definitely work on those main things I mentioned, who you are, what you do, and what you want to accomplish. Okay, next one. 
So some elevator pitch final tips, um, take your time and make it conversational, avoid niche words and phrases, and also express confidence while um, delivering your elevator pitch. You wanna make it cool, casual, and also quick. You wanna get in and out and explain why you're there, what you wanna do, and who you are as well. So. I think that's it for the presentation. So hopefully that was a quick explanation of what an elevator pitch is. And um, hopefully you can um, write your own through all the tips I said in this presentation. Great, thank you so much, Abby, for this great information and your participation, of course. Um, as she mentioned, take, I hope you now you are ready to start working on your elevator pitch uh, as you've been, um, as you know, this uh, will help you when you are um, networking or even meeting people at a job interview, et cetera. So thank you so much, Abby, for, for this great uh, presentation. And now um, we are going to be talking about uh, how to uh, mastering and leveraging LinkedIn. And to give this presentation, we have Olga, uh, who is representing University of Texas at Austin. And she is also from graduate career and professional development uh, career engagement. So thank you so much, Olga, for being here. The time is yours. Excellent. All right. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Olga Kutsaridi. I am the Senior Graduate Student Coordinator for Global Mobility in the Office of Texas Career Engagement at the University of Texas at Austin. I'm very excited to talk to you all about LinkedIn and help you learn how to put together an attention-grabbing LinkedIn profile and show you how to leverage your LinkedIn as a tool in effectively connecting with professionals, as was mentioned earlier. Next slide. So we have two main learning objectives today. First and foremost, we will review the process of creating an effective and dynamic LinkedIn profile that really highlights and tells your career story and brings your professional brand to life. Um, I will share a handout that you can use uh, to evaluate your existing profile or create a strong one from scratch. So that will be at the end and you can download that. Second, we will look at how to leverage your profile to identify connections that really match your interests and skills. And we'll do that throughout um, the session. And then one of my main learning outcomes for you all is to really leave today feeling energized and empowered to build your professional LinkedIn profile and explore the range of networking capabilities Abilities LinkedIn has to offer to achieve your own career and professional development uh, goals. Next slide, please. All right, and this is like a really quick interactive piece. So let me know in the chat by just putting a Y or an N. Um, do you have a LinkedIn profile? Y or an N if you want to participate? Awesome. I see some yeses. Uh, that's very exciting. So today we're really going to talk about um, optimizing the profile. So this is great news. And then have you ever used, if you have a profile, you have used it. So that is wonderful news. All right, on to the next slide. So um, we will begin by talking about ways you can really optimize your LinkedIn profile. So what are the most important features and what do you need to focus on to really stand out? Um, I do want you to remember that your profile represents you as a professional. So um, it is important to talk about things, um, you know, that really reflect uh, what that means uh, and that you can build a persuasive career story using your strong uh, profile. So before talking about how, uh, we'll very briefly look at uh, the why. Uh, next slide, please. So you might be wondering what is the value or what are the benefits of having a strong LinkedIn profile? So first it allows you to build a personal brand and to tell your story. It and really lets you have like full control over that narrative. Second, it's a way for you to effectively communicate uh, with recruiters and employers, colleagues, um, fam family, friends, everyone who's in your network and you can show them who you are and what you do. It garners credibility. Uh, all of the job recruiters and managers are pretty much on LinkedIn. And it also helps others identify the value uh, that you bring that you know, comes from connecting with you. 
Uh, you can also, of course, uh, generate a lot of passive opportunities. So if you design uh, your profile and if you maintain an active and well put together profile, you can easily uh, be discovered by recruiters or hiring managers who are looking for people with your specific skills, experiences, and qualifications. It also allows you to build connections and network efficiently and effectively because you can tap into first degree, second degree, and even third degree connections. And so asking a friend to connect you to somebody that they know who works at Google, for example. Um, and then it also helps rank your name uh, in Google so you show up um, at the top. Next slide, please. And so just a couple of things that are important to keep in mind, 94% of all the organizations, at least in the US, use social media to recruit talent. So your LinkedIn profile allows you to really kind of, you know, take control of that prof professional image and your brand. Okay. Now that we've talked about the how, uh, we'll talk about, um, or we talked about the why, now we'll move on to the how. Next slide, please. All right, um, now that you understand the value of having a LinkedIn profile, let's talk about the how. And we'll start with the top five things you need to do and focus on when building your strong LinkedIn profile. Um, click on it five times, yeah, thanks. Uh, so the first thing is you wanna choose an appropriate photo. You want to customize uh, your headline. You want to write your summary or the about section. Then you wanna set a custom URL and you wanna include reach media to really help you tell that story. Okay, next slide. Your picture, headline, and summary are the three most important areas of your profile. So it makes sense for you all to really pay attention, uh, special attention and focus on these three aspects first and foremost. So your picture should be, a, if possible, a professional headshot. Your headline should tell us what you do. This is why it's important to really go in and customize your headline instead of sort of relying on the default position. And then your summary should really uh, create a narrative of all your different experiences and your academic uh, expertise. Uh, people respond to faces over anonymous icons. So it, the photo is uh, strangely important. So if you do these three things, you can create uh, trust and credibility with people who are looking at your profile, right? It's also important to keep in mind that, um, as I said, LinkedIn scans your headline and your summary for keywords so that they can connect you to recruiters, organizations, and similar users. So making sure that you go in um, and you know include those keywords is going to be really important. And I'll, I'll show you tons of examples that you can use uh, to create your own. Uh, so let's look at each of these points individually really quickly. So next slide, please. And so the first thing I wanted to show you is seven different examples of really um, not great photos. So clip cl clicking, I put a lot of animation in <laughs> into it to make it a little more interactive. So if we look at the bad examples, what are you seeing? Like lots of bad lighting, hard to see, small face. Um, things that are just not uh, good, right? So the five things that you do want to keep in mind when choosing a profile photo is possibly using an actual professional headshot, right? Good lighting, or at least being well lit. You want uh, your face to sort of look forward. Uh, and then you want your closing to be in alignment with the type of company culture that you're aiming for. So for example, uh, if you dress as a finance or like, you know, looking like a bank uh, person, and then you apply for a tech startup, you know, there and you're wearing a three-piece suit, there might be a misalignment in terms of uh, culture, right? Uh, especially if you're applying to be like a software engineer uh, at a startup in Austin. Uh, and then the last thing to remember is that you just wanna use a high quality photo. So those are the top things to keep in mind with photos. Uh, next slide, please. Now we'll talk about customized uh, titles and headlines. And so um, I think it's really important um, to once again, go in and tailor your headline to reflect and to really communicate what you do and how you are different. So it's a way for you to also differentiate yourself from talent. 
So your headline is a short one-liner that uh, appears under your name within your profile. It also shows up in the home feed uh, in LinkedIn uh, alongside your photo every time you sort of post or create any type of content. So your headline is often like the first thing along with your photo that people see. So that's why it's important to spend a little bit of time on it and think of it almost as a branding statement. Next slide, please. So as far as remembering uh, two things that are really important when customizing your headline is you want to use industry keywords in your headline. So the keywords will, you know, once again, feed that algorithm and connect you to professional uh, opportunities and communities. And um, you can also, for example, put like aspiring uh, in front of the you know, type of position that you're interested in. So UX uh, or UI designer communicating to recruiters, right? That you're actively looking for similar types of opportunities. Um, second, you want to include your skills and or passions. Um, you know, it, it, those are some of the ways that you can differentiate yourself from other candidates. And this is just an example uh, as Liz Lewis, um, she's a, she was a PhD student at UT, who's now a qualitative researcher. You know, that's a particular skill set that she brings anthropologist and cultural um, storyteller. Guess what Liz's actual title is? She's a content marketing manager at Indeed, but her headline is so much more inclusive of what she brings. Um, next slide. Tons of other examples I just wanted you to have, um, you know, as inspiration, but do make sure to check out profiles that you really resonate with and then use them um, to create your own. Next slide. I think I have just a couple more minutes. Um, there are uh, great new features on LinkedIn as well. You can add a green label to your profile. And so all you have to do is click on open to and select finding a new job. And uh, if you click on the next slide, it'll show you uh, with yeah some animation where you can do that. Next slide. And so as you can see, there's uh, a green label that will now be a part of your profile once you go through all of these steps. And so click next slide um, three more times, please. Perfect. And so now you saw that photo will display the green label. Uh, and also when recruiters are running searches, it will pull you with that uh, population. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about on the slide that's next is how to create a summary or the about section. So there are really five things that I want you all to think about. Uh, and so if we turn our attention to the summary, some of the best practices are when writing it is one, always including a hook to draw in your reader. Two, um, try and use the first person and try and use slightly more conversational tone than the one you see in a cover letter. And then three is to provide a narrative that can really kind of string together all of your experiences. Uh, four, absolutely highlight some of your accomplishments or achievements. Uh, and really uh, sort of explain why, what was the contribution that you made. And then lastly, at the bottom, you can include a keywords or specialties uh, section to list some of those keywords. So the search engine picks up um, them from your profile. And once again, I just always wanna make sure I provide you all with a strong example. So here, Candace's uh, profile, you can absolutely read it to get inspiration to write your own summary. All right, I think I'm at the 10 minute mark, so I'll, I'll stop right there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Olga, uh, for sharing this important information. I know it's a, it's a broad topic, uh, but you did a great job just making a, a summarize. Um, as she mentioned, uh, we will be sharing with all the people who uh, register for this event, um, some of the resources that she mentioned uh, and some of the um, um, things that you can see uh, on, on the presentation. Uh, I think you were almost <laughs> done with that part. Um, but I know, uh, take for example, not only UT Austin in this case, but I know many other um, institutions 
Um, they do have good resources that you can use as a reference uh, to start working on your LinkedIn profile. So uh, we will make sure, Olga, to share these important resources uh, with everyone who has registered for this event. Thank you so much uh, for this presentation. And now we are going to have um, Marina, Marina Passos, who is Associate Director of Recruitment and Marketing at Northeastern University. Um, she will be talking about life beyond graduation, uh, the different opportunities for international students um, doing internships, graduate programs, and beyond. Thank you, Marina, for being here, and the time is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, as Yandi mentioned, I'm part of the International Enrollment Management Team at Northeastern University. So it's a pleasure to be here tonight talking to you a little bit more about life beyond graduation. Okay, so there is no way to actually talk about life beyond graduation without, without talking about life before graduation, right? And it actually involves something called curricular practical training or simply CPT. So CPT is a form of, of authorization available for eligible F1, student, uh, F1 students during their program of study for experiential learning opportunities that are necessary or required as part of an academic program. It includes um, approved experiential learning opportunities, such as co-op, internship, um, clinical rotation, corporate residency, and so on. And the activity may take place on or off campus. It can be paid or unpaid. It can be part-time or full-time. Please, uh, next slide, please. Um, so I would say, that the most valuable kind of experiential learning opportunity is the cooperative education or simply co-op. So by alternating semesters of academic studies with periods of full-time work, you can actually explore or refine potential career paths. You can make valuable industry connections, networking, which we talked about earlier today, you can broaden perspectives. Um, you can acquire the skills and knowledge needed to su succeed within your field of studies. And all of this while learning and growing outside the com comfort zone of the classroom. So this is an opportunity for you to dive deeper into the field of studies of your choice, to develop skills, to apply theory into practice, and how does it relate to life beyond graduation? Well, what you need to know is that this experience develops learners who are highly competitive upon graduation. I'm gonna give you an example. At Northeastern University, 93% of our undergraduate students, they are, they are employed or enrolled in graduate school nine months after graduation. And you may also ask, what's the difference between co-op education and internships? So let's go to the next slide. There you go. All right, so um, first of all, there is length. Internships, they are often short-term positions, two to three months, and co-op can last from five to eight months. Co-op is a full-time job, that has to relate to your field of studies. It means that you're going to work 40 hours a week, whereas internships, they usually include part-time entry positions that not necessarily need to be linked to your field of studies. Also, in, for, for, for employability, um, this is actually really important data as well. And that data also refers to Northeastern specifically. 50% um, of students who attend co-op each year, they actually are offered job positions upon graduation. And also, yes, co-op positions, they are mostly paid, whereas for internships, they are uh, mostly unpaid positions. Next slide, please. So now let's talk about post-completion work authorization. 
So also for F1 student, students, so international students who are on an F1 visa, um, you may apply for post-completion optional practical training or simply OPT. Um, this is basically a temporary employment that is directly related to an F1 student major's um, area of study. So the duration of an OPT is 12 months. However, it can go up to three years if you have graduated from a STEM degree. If you're not aware of what STEM degree stands for, it is actually science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But most important, as students, you need to understand that all of this that I have just talked about depend on you. So remember that you must always comply with visa regulations. You must achieve good academic records to be eligible for both CPT or OPT. Um, so basically your life beyond graduation is actually on your hands. So make the best of your time overseas, participate in universities events and opportunities, do a lot of networking, be a constructive member of the classroom, Particip but participate actively on your program overall. And with that, you'll be able to expand your opportunities upon graduation as well. Thank you. That was quick and painful. <laughs> I'm sorry, painless. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Marina, for this great information and these great opportunities that are uh, specifically for international students. Uh, make sure you take uh, note of Marina's contact if you are interested in learning more about what she explained. She will be coming back, of course, to talk specifically a little bit more about the opportunities at Northeastern University. Thank you, Marina. And, and last but not least, we'll have uh, Mastering the Art of the Job Interview. Uh, we have Jose Infante, who's Associate Director of International Recruitment at Towson University. Thank you so much, Jose, for being here today. And the time is yours. Thank you. So let's talk about um, how to behave, how to react at a uh, job interview. With all of these uh, presentations, I feel that I should just say thank you and good night. Uh, but I am going to plow through uh, these few slides and talk about and maybe mention some of the presentations that we've seen before. So the first thing you need to do once you are called uh, for a meeting is do your research. What does the company do? What do they value? Who's conducting the interview? Can you find them on LinkedIn? Make sure you go to the interview with research from the company or off the company. Bring up some of their past pro bring up some of their past projects in your answers. It shows them their your dedication, your interest, your ability to research. It also shows your interviewer that you want the job and you are willing to go above and beyond the expectations. Do your research. Next slide, please. Prepare answers. Now, tell me about yourself. What are some of your strengths? How would you have you ever encountered, these are typical questions and use your research. You heard a presentation about um, elevator pitch. This is the most typical one. Tell me about yourself. Most of you start with, I was born in 1852, and then you start with a life story. It's less than a 60 seconds presentation about who you are. Make a list of questions that might, they, they might ask and practice answering them. It will help you feel more confident when you are interviewing for the job. Next slide. This might seem obvious, but <clears throat> they need to be said. Uh, I don't know how many times I have seen people come into my um, 
office and I look at them and I think, really? Is that the way you want to present yourself? Just appropriately. Get comfortable, but not disrespectful, right? Um, don't be nervous. If you did your research, you should be fine. Remember, it's a conversation. You are interviewing them as much as they are interviewing you because you want to know if you want to work for that company. Um, administer respect. This is very important. Your interviewer is someone you are trying to impress. Therefore, mind your manners. And he is it's friendly with you, it doesn't mean you have to get friendly with him. Interview as a consultant. Thinking and acting like a consultant gives you the framework for approaching the process effectively. This is to say, most people who go into a sales meeting, they go in with the whole framework of, I need to follow up. My, the whole purpose of this meeting is to find out what is it that they need and how I am going to provide it. Uh, next slide. So a good consultant listens and probes for information to gain understanding of the opportunity on how they can add value. So the needs, what is important to the person interviewing you? What are their priorities for the job? The challenges or issues? What are the key issues? What are the challenges of the position? How can you address them effectively? These are questions that you are asking. This is part of the interaction in the conversation. This is the back and forth. Objections. What are the objections or barriers that you see them having about you having that job? What would be prevent uh, uh, from moving forward? What would prevent you from moving forward with you? Mm, you may not know this right away, but you begin to get a feeling based on the answers, and you want to reinforce those. Take notes because the follow up is important. Competition. There's questions you should be asking. What is the ideal candidate? How do you compare? And of course, the follow-up. Some people call this thank you letters. I call them influence letters. Thank you for your time. Address the key issues the interviewer expressed and how you would make their, the make, make their life better, make the job better. Excuse me, reinforce the benefits of being part of their team. Um, if you really want the job, say it. Don't be shy. There's no time to be shy. Next slide. That's all you need to do. Use your network. Use your 30-second uh, speeches. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose, for sharing these um, tips on how to succeed at a job interview. Um, just and, and now um, this you can apply some of these tips also if you are um, getting an interview for a graduate program, for instance. Thank you so much, um, Jose. Absolutely. Thank you. And now um, we are going to be um, listening and learning a little bit more about each of the institutions that have participated. Uh, first, um, we're going to start again with Iowa State University. Um, I will recommend you if you have any questions or comments, please type them in the chat box and we will review them in a few more minutes. Thank you. Great, I am going to talk a little bit about Iowa State University. Um, I was gonna share my screen, but it doesn't look like I have access to that. Um, okay, you can share your screen get it? now. Go ahead, okay. yes, thank awesome. you. Awesome. All right, let's do this one. All right, can you see my screen okay? 
Yes, perfect. Okay, perfect. All right. So this is the Iowa State University website that you can take a look at um, if you are interested. So I was actually a graduate student at Iowa State many years ago. Um, but Iowa State is the United States' most student-centered public research university. I was scrolling through and I saw um, you can see a picture of our athletics and I saw this picture, I think near the bottom, this one, which I thought was just beautiful. Um, I actually walk on this sidewalk every day to go to my office, um, but the Carnegie, Carnegie classification recognizes ISU as a research one doctoral university, indicating that it has very high research activity. It's located in the Midwest, so pretty much right almost in the middle of the United States, Iowa State is the largest university in Iowa. Um, we have about 30,000 undergraduate and graduate students. Employers value Iowa State students' work ethic and involvement in campus initiatives. Um, so I wanted to show you this picture of one of our career fairs. So we have a lot of different career fairs on campus each year and they attract a lot of employers who are very excited to hire Iowa State students and graduates. Students gain a lot of hands-on experience by taking advantage of over 900 student organizations as active members and leaders. ISU emphasizes entrepreneurship and innovation through outstanding coursework, programming, mentoring, and funding to help students turn ideas into realities that make the world a better place. The Iowa State University Research Park supports nearly 100 entrepreneurial ventures and businesses they also have over 900 student interns every year. It provides students with numerous opportunities to, that are very close to campus um, to gain professional work experience before graduation. I just wanted to show you some of those career opportunities and career support. Um, and again, that emphasis, lots of emphasis on research and innovation. Um, as I showed you, or you can kind of see from some of the photos that I've been pulling up, um, Iowa State is ranked as one of the most beautiful campuses in the United States, and students enjoy the picturesque park-like outdoor spaces. Ames is recognized as a safe community with accessible public transportation and a high quality of life. Uh, according to the City of Ames website, about half of the city's population is Iowa State students, which creates a close connection between the university and the community. Students, alumni, and community members enjoy cheering on sporting events as part of the Big 12 Collegiate Athletic Conference with 16 varsity teams and 12 sports. ISU draws many international students. Um, because of its outstanding academic programs in science and technology and numerous hands-on opportunities for discovery and innovation. The top majors that international students enroll in are computer science, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, civil construction and environmental engineering, and statistics. Pictured here is the International Student Council, which is very active and involved. They partner closely with campus offices and the city of Ames to create a welcoming and impactful experience for all students. The International Student Council, as you can see, hosts multiple large-scale, well-attended events each year to celebrate and showcase the international diversity at Iowa State. So if you are interested in learning more, you can definitely go to our website, iostate.edu. Um, we actually just redid our website, so it has plenty of fresh photos that you can kind of see and get a feel for what it looks like. Um, there's admissions information here. If you're interested in looking at that, academics, more about our professional um, and our graduate programs here. So if you wanna take a look at that. Um, a lot of the pages too, as you'll see, if you kind of click through, um, have some really wonderful videos too. So we were recently uh, featured on the college tour. And so there's really great informational videos that you can watch and get a feel for campus also. And that's what I've got for Iowa State. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren, for um letting us know more about the campus and the institution at Iowa State University. Um, and now I think we're gonna go back to our presentation. 
and we're gonna be talking about uh, Texas Tech going back to Abby. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, one second. I know I sent y'all a presentation, but can I share my screen with a different presentation? Sure. Yeah. Let me just give you the co-host, right? Just a sec. Okay. I think you should be able to share your screen. Perfect. Okay. Um, I'm going to be talking about Texas Tech University and our graduate school here at Texas Tech. So Texas Tech University, we're located in Lubbock, Texas. So as you can see from this map, this is kind of where we are located um, in regards to New Mexico, Oklahoma, and Texas as a whole. So we're kind of West Texas. It's kind of what we refer to our location in Texas. We have more than 75 venues and parks and also international restaurants and markets, as well as 36 museum, art centers, libraries, feature local musicians and artists. So here at Texas Tech University, we have a diverse campus. We have 67% ethnic diversity, over 20% more than the national average. We also have 60% geographic diversity, over 17% more than the national average. We have around 2,900 um, 2, plus international students on our campus and over 100 countries represented here at Texas Tech. So we have 150 plus undergraduate programs, 100 plus master's programs, 60 plus doctoral programs, and 60 plus certificate programs. We are a comprehensive university, so we offer students many choices in degree programs. We're located on almost 2,000 acres of land, like I said, located in Lubbock, Texas, where there are 250,000 plus residents in this area. We're also ranked among the best universities in the US in STEM education and ranked in the highest, most elite category of US universities by the Carnegie Commission. We are a tier one institution. We're also one of the most affordable large public universities in the US and rated one of the safest campuses in the United States. Some points of pride, we are ranked top 2% of universities in the world and ranked 35th in research expenditures and top 10% in both graduate enrollment and STEM graduate enrollment of US universities. We're also in the top 12% in the number of doctoral degrees awarded. So getting into the programs and colleges that are represented here at Texas Tech University. So we have the Davis College of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources, College of Architecture, College of Arts and Sciences, the Jerry S. Rawls College of Business Administration, College of Education, and then the Edward E. Whitaker Junior College of Engineering, Honors College, College of Human Sciences, the College of Media and Communication, and also the J.T. Margaret Talkington College of Visual and Performing Arts. So we have a ton of different programs and colleges represented here at Texas Tech. Here at TTU, you'll also learn from the best. We have state-of-the-art equipment and facilities that internationally recognize faculty who integrate their research into their classes and mentoring. Here are just a few of the professors we have here at TTU and the research they have done or are currently doing. Some hallmarks of grad study here at Texas Tech, we offer individualized programs of study to meet students' career objectives, comprehensive professional and career development program to complement disciplinary training. We also offer opportunities to engage in practical experience that attracts employers such as internships. And we also have the Graduate Center and the Graduate Writing Center, which both provide academic and support services dedicated to graduate students. We are a research-driven university, so we have certain research focal areas here at TTU that include sustainable society, creative capital, computational and theoretical sciences, integrated biosciences, communication and culture, education and assessment, and advanced electronics and materials. We also have 80 plus specialized institutes and centers such as the Center for Biotechnology and Genomics, the Center for Science and Engineering of Cybersecurity, Burkhart Center for Autism Education and Research, Institute for Internet Viral Behavior, Water Resources Center, Center for the Study of Addiction and Recovery, and the Center for Advanced Analytics and Business Intelligence. 
Getting into admission requirements, I'm going to just go over this briefly. To apply to our grad school, you'll apply online through our main website. You'll go to go.grad.ttu.edu slash apply to access our application site. As an international student, you'll be required to meet the English proficiency requirement and then submit required documentation, which includes transcripts and original language and certified English translation. We have a no minimum GPA requirement to apply, copy of diploma or degree certification, departmental application requirements, which include but um, aren't limited to letters of recommendation, resume, CV, statement of purpose, GRE or GMAT, and we have a no minimum test score requirement to apply as well. And then also your passport biography page. Also, just to note, the GRE is optional through summer 24 for all of our graduate programs here at Texas Tech. Some good deadlines to keep in mind for fall and summer is January 15th, and then spring is June 15th is our priority funding deadlines. This kind of goes over the English proficiency requirement. Um, all this is listed on our main website, so you can kind of go through and see um, all the options you have to meet that requirement. So funding, some funding information we have. So uh, here at Texas Tech Grad School, we offer assistantships for teaching and research. These are typically awarded through the academic department. Your application for admission is used for funding consideration. Um, graduate school fellowships and scholarships, those applications are available online on our main website and open at the same time as applications for admission do. And then also government and private fellowships, student employment and loans are other ways you can fund your education here at Texas Tech. And then also here's all of our contact information. So our main website is gradschool.t2.edu. This will give you a ton of information about our grad school, it has a ton of information I listed here in the presentation that you can refer back to, as well as our application site and a list of all the programs that we do offer here at Texas Tech. Our phone number, as well as our email addresses. Um, you can reach out to us if you have any further questions regarding the application process or the grad school here at Texas Tech. And we also have a ton of social media handles. So we have Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, as well as our own YouTube channel. So feel free to follow us along and see what we're doing here at the grad school at Texas Tech. Thank you so much. And please reach out if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Abby for sharing this um, great information and this opportunity so we can learn a little bit more about uh, Texas Tech. Um, and now we, I think we're going to have um, University of Texas at Austin. I think Olga, um, if you want to share a little bit of information, time is yours, thank you. Absolutely. I'm just going to go ahead and um, share my screen, but I didn't, I don't have slides. I just want to walk you through the, the website and show you some kind of key pages that you probably want to check out when you're doing research on the types of graduate programs. Um, I will say that UT is one of the largest universities in the US. I'm not sure if we're second or third. Uh, funny enough, I went to both the Ohio State University and the, the University of Texas at Austin, which are both like you know, 50,000 plus students. Um, so UT Austin, uh, the one of the coolest thing about the university is that we are located in Austin. Uh, it's a very vibrant uh, city and there's a lot of things happening in terms of industry, right? So, um, you know, San Francisco, the Bay Area and New Jersey are big biotech and Silicon Valley is, of course, a tech hub, but Austin is sort of becoming this, you know, epicenter as well. So um, obviously we have Tesla here now, but we have many other things going on. So having the university really close by and be plugged in. So that just means that we have a lot of employer events. We do a lot of info sessions and, and bring people in uh, that way. Let me see. Can I share my screen? Yes. Yes, you okay. can. Excellent. So I'll go ahead and share my screen really quickly. So um, I just wanted to explain a little bit about um, kind of where I'm positioned in the university. So I'm part of the Central Career Services. We have 18 colleges here at the University of Texas at Austin. And so my office provides career and professional development support to all, um, to all uh, graduate students and all students. Um, I am sorry, I think 
my computer might have frozen. Um, if somebody could say, if you can at least hear me, I'll keep talking. We can we can hear you, but the we cannot see your screen. Yes, I assumed uh, the screen part is sort of frozen. So I'll at least keep talking so you can learn a little bit more about UT. So um, every career, um, every college has their own career service. As I mentioned, we have 18 colleges here at UT. And then in addition to having your own career service office in your college, you can also come see us in Texas Career Engagement and we can help you with your career and professional development um, uh, through us. And uh, we have 200 plus graduate career programs that which includes both masters and PhD level programs. Um, I think, you know, um, when deciding about what graduate program you want to pursue, I would do quite a bit of research to make sure that the curriculum aligns with the types of skills you want to develop. But to say that at any graduate degree that you get from the University of Texas at Austin prepares you to be an incredibly competitive candidate uh, in pretty much any job search, whether you want to pursue an academic job search, uh, which means, you know, maybe you want to be a professor at a research one university such as UT, or maybe you want to teach at a teaching focused university like a liberal arts college. Uh, in addition to preparing you for the academic job market, your degree from UT will prepare you for industry. So um, we have right now 11,000 uh, international, uh, sorry, 11,000 total graduate students. Out of those 11,000, 30% are international graduate students. So my role was specifically created to just work with international students on career and professional development here at UT Austin. So because of some of the specific challenges and kind of nuances of your lived experience as a candidate possibly applying to uh, positions uh, once you graduate from UT, as was mentioned here, whether Um, I believe we lost Olga. I th she did mention that she was having um, internet connection problems. Um, while she gets back, we can uh, learn a little bit more about Northeastern University. I think, uh, Marina, you are able to share your screen. Yes, thank you. Just one second. So hi everyone once again. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to talk to you a little bit more about Northeastern University. I think that you can all um, see my screen, right? Yes. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, so just to give you some brief information about, about Northeastern. So we are a tier one research university and now we are based in Boston. And we are currently ranked among the top 50 US national universities. And we are currently ranked number one for co-op and internships, which I spoke about a little bit earlier today. So we have more than 3,000 employer partners um, and also more than 10,000 students attending the co-op program each year. Our experiential learning program is really what differentiates us from any other university in the US. As I mentioned, we are based in Boston, that's our main campus, but we also have some regional campuses across the U.S. in San Francisco, Silicon Valley, Seattle, Portland in Maine, and also in uh, Vancouver, Toronto in Canada, and also in London in the U.K. All of these campuses, they offer graduate programs and they are open for international students. But when we're talking about Boston, um, we are located in the near downtown. So we are really close to a lot of shops, restaurants, cafes, uh, malls, also to landmarks. We have four subway stops passing through campus. So we are really well located in the heart of Boston. And Boston, as you know, that's a university campus. It's a university city. So it has more than 200,000 students attending um, undergraduate and graduate programs in the city nowadays. Um, our campus was founded over one year, 100 years ago, uh, and we have 
more than 200 degrees offered through our nine colleges. So we have the College of Arts, Media and Design, the School of Business, um, Computer Science, College of Health Sciences, the College of Engineering, the College of Science, College of Social Science and the Humanities, the College of Professional Studies and the School of Law. And as I mentioned, we have more than 200 degrees offered throughout our campuses. Uh, right now, we have more than 15,000 students enrolled in graduate studies, um, and that, that actually applies for all of our campuses. And right now in Boston, we have around 25,000 students attending undergrad and graduate um, programs. Um, we have a department that is dedicated to international students, so the Office of Global Services assists all of our international students on questions and queries and concerns about immigration, um, employment, health insurance, um, any questions that you might have related to pre-departure uh, orientation and also post-departure as well. Oops, sorry about that, let me go back. So the Office of Global Services is open to um, assist all of our international students uh, when applying to your visa, um, submitting your Y20 request and all of these things. One thing that I, we are really proud of is that we have a great network of student ambassadors and also alumni. So at Northeastern, we have that, um, let's say, um, initiative that includes current students and alumni who are willing to talk to prospective students and address any concerns that they might have regarding life um, at the university. So you are able to connect with current students and alumni so they can share their experiences at Northeastern with you. So you can ask questions about housing, um, let's say um, any questions that you might have regarding our courses, the curriculum and all of this, you can reach out to our student ambassadors. And you can find that information on the website. So if you log in to northeastern.edu, you're gonna be able to find information about the student ambassadors and also regarding any events that we are hosting online um, that you can join. Um, it is very important that you join all the events that universities are presenting because that's an opportunity for you to get to know the university better, get to know a specific program of your choice better as well. Um, so I would say it's really important for you to connect with the university just to learn a little bit more about it. On our website, you will also be able to access our uh, YouTube channel where you can watch um, some testimonials and also um, videos about specific programs of your choice. As I mentioned before, oh my God, it's just moving. There you go. As I mentioned before, we are a tier one research university. So we are a lot focused on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. But I would also like to point out our programs uh, re related to business and also law. So our MBA program is really strong as also is the LLM program. If you have any specific questions, you can reach out to us anytime. And also just for admissions requirements at the university, um, just remember that as an international student, you will need to comply with a few requirements when it comes to um, English proficiency exam. So at the university, we accept TOEFL, IELTS, Duolingo, PTE, um, as English proficiency exams, but also um, you need to uh, be, be, be aware that as um, graduate students, you might need to also provide standardized testings, which are GMAT and GRE. Uh, for GRE, we are waiving GRE for fall 23. For, G for GMAT, unfortunately, we cannot waive them. Also, um, as hard data, we will also need your transcripts from your, your undergraduate studies. And as soft data, which are documents that can be controlled by you. So basically, um, these documents, no one else, no other candidate will have the same as you. So that includes your letters of recommendation and also the statement of purpose. This is just general overview of the admissions requirements plus, but let me just go back here. 
be aware of that all these admissions requirements, they will vary according to the program that you wish to apply for. So as I mentioned before, we have more than 200 degrees and each college within Northeastern has its own policies when it comes to general admissions requirements. Let's say the number of letters of recommendation that you need to provide or a minimum GPA or minimal TOEFL scores, they will vary according to the college and the program that you are applying for. So that's why please feel free to connect with us and to um, look for information, search for information on the website as well. But once again, if you have any questions, just please feel free to reach out to us at lapdown at northeastern.eu. Thank you. Thank you, Marina, for sharing this information uh, so we can learn more about Northeastern. Um, and now we are going to learn about Towson University. Uh, let me go back and share my screen. So we can have Jose um, give also his presentation. Okay. And the time is yours, Jose, thank you. Thank you very much. So about Towson University, can we go to the next slide? All right. Well, first, I wanted to mention that Towson University is located in the East Coast of the United States. Uh, we are surrounded by or bordered by Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, and Delaware. We are considered the best uh, number six state in the continental US uh, with proximity to New York City. Philadelphia and Washington, DC. We have two international airports and we are considered among the top 15 college destinations for employment and education. Our in the Maryland industry strengths are in biohealth, financial services, cybersecurity, agribusiness, transportation, and manufacturing. We have over 900 internationally owned business. So what am I saying? Here in Maryland, we're not Northerners, we're not Southerners, we're just simply better. And we're trying to get you guys to Maryland. So come on over. Next slide. About Towson University, we are the second largest university in the university system of Maryland. Um, we have over 110 majors with an average class size of 24 students with a student ratio 16 to one. We have over 60 undergraduate programs and over 80 graduate programs. Um, a ranking snap, snapshot, um, we're one of the best public universities in the country according to US News World Report. And we have been considered one of the best um, ROI for your investment in your education according to Money Magazine. Next slide. Towson University has six different colleges. Um, let me begin by uh, describing a few, um, a little bit of them. College of Business and, and Economics, we're talking about most popular majors for international students, uh, marketing intelligence, supply chain management, accounting, human resources. College of Communications and Fine Arts, here we're talking about music, performing arts, composition, um, communication management. We were born as uh, the College of Education. We were born as an education school. So here in our graduate program, we have instrument, instructional technology, reading, education, um, creative education, and administration. The College of Liberal Arts provides master's degrees in psychology, human resource development, professional writing, global humanities. So just some of the few, uh, and mainly uh, I mentioned these because these are popular for, whoa, these are popular for international students. College of Health Professions, we're talking about physician assistants, speech language pathology and audiology, nursing, occupational therapy. And then of course we have Fisher College of Science and Math. This is where all our STEM programs live. 
We have applied information technology, computer science, biology, environmental science, to mention a few. Next slide. Our top majors for grad international are computer science, applied information technology, information technology, supply chain management, marketing intelligence, accounting and business advisory services, and human resources. Very interesting, the whole thing about human resources. Um, next slide, please. Uh, please hit again. All right. So to apply, you need to, it's a two-step approach. You need to apply to the university with that same application. If you are admissible, it will be moved forward to your program director. What are we requiring? For example, we are requiring uh, your an undergraduate degree. Uh, test scores, some of them do we require GRE, some of them require the um, MATS. Um, a statement of intent, a resume, letters of recommendations, portfolio if it's needed, okay? Please take a look at, again, your, there's the Towson application and then there is the program requirements. In the same application, all you need to do is just make sure that you cover both bases. Application deadlines, by the way, let me go back and say that we have a list of countries and after these slides, I'm going to um, ask to if I can share my screen, but English proficiency, um, we take Duolingo, we take TOEFL, we take IELTS. The application deadlines for the fall was August 15th. For the spring, it'll be January 7th. And for the summer, it'll be May 1st. Um, you can do your application through our um, 1000.edu. Uh, it's a $45 fee. And these are some of the options that you can have as a fee waiver. Next slide. This is my contact information. If anyone wants more specific information about the university or about the program that you are interested in, please um, do uh, contact me at international at thousand.edu. Now, if I could share my screen for a little bit. Yes, you can, you are able to share your screen. Thank you. I just wanna uh, share. We'll stop screen. So I was mentioning about the English proficiency. So these are some of the tests that we take, but most importantly, I want you to take a look at these particular countries. Mexico is not in it. So we are looking at this, okay? When you are looking at your grad program, please make sure that you go into this page, graduate program and immigration compliance with F1 or J1 visas. These are the programs available for international students. There's a nice list. Some of them may ask for additional requirements, but still it's a nice list. Uh, we have fellowships and assistantships. As we were talking, as someone mentioned, our assistantships are for graduate teaching assistants, research. There's a full-time, which is 20 hours. Half-time is 10 hours. Um, and the advantage of assistantship, you can read that up, but mainly this happens right after your admissions letter. You could apply immediately. Again, if you have any questions, please, uh, you are more than welcome to reach me at international at thousand.edu. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. Um, I'll put that in for the chat sharing. as well. Yes, yes, thank you. And also we will be sharing with you uh, everyone's contact information, with everyone in the audience, everyone's uh, contact information. 
Uh, and now uh, we're gonna have some, uh, about five minutes for Q&A. Uh, and Magali, the time is yours. Thank you. Um, just to make sure, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, we're going to start with this question and who would like to answer is it's free to answer, okay? So we are going to start with this one. Number one, what are the most common grad programs at your institution? Who would like to answer? Um, I can start. Thank you. Okay, so um, as I mentioned before, we are really strong when it comes to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Um, however, I would like to highlight a few programs that uh, they are most popular among uh, international students. And those are the Master of Science in Computer Science, Information Systems, Project Management, um, MBA, Business Analytics, and also the LLM program. Aside from that, we do offer, as I mentioned, more than 200 degrees, but I just wanted to point out those ones. Um, it's very important that every student, every candidate um, search for their program's curriculums just to make sure that they align with their expectations and their uh, professional goals as well. Um, and be mindful that most of their programs they offer um, required courses, elective courses, and also a choice of concentration. So I'm gonna give you an example. The Master of uh, Project Management program at Northeastern, it requires um, some uh, required courses, electives, but also students can choose between seven different concentrations. So they can concentrate on leadership, um, business analytics, organizational communication, and so on. All right, thank you. Thank you, Marina. Anyone else would like to answer that question or we can continue to the next one. I'll jump in. I'll just kind of piggyback off she said. Um, our programs are kind of popular as amongst like what she was saying, such as like our computer science program is very, very popular, um, as well as our STEM MBA, our other MBA programs that are offered, as well as our data science program. Uh, we also have a civil engineering, mechanical engineering, petroleum engineering. Um, we also have um, construction engineering, a lot of different engineering programs that are very popular as well. Um, and those are kind of our main popular ones amongst international students. But Thank I you. also, sorry, I also put in the chat a list to all the programs we offer at Texas Tech. So you can kind of view that on your own time to see if any of those uh, match up with what you're wanting to study. Perfect. Thank you, Abby. Okay, let me see the chat if we have another question and we can continue to the next. Uh, okay, we're going to continue to the next question. Like I said, any any of you can answer. Number two, what are some of the opportunities for international students? What are some? What, what are some what? Opportunities for international students. I know the um, question. <laughs> yeah, but when it comes to what exactly? Like opportunities for Assistantships, fellowships, assistantships, assistantships fellowships, scholarships, uh, in particular for international students. Any programs? Okay. Um, at Northeastern, we offer merit-based scholarships for international students. So there is no specific form and all candidates, they are, they will be considered for a partial scholarship. If the student is eligible, uh, they will be advised upon acceptance to the program. Aside from that, um, there are also, um, one of my colleagues presented about it, talked about it, but we do also offer assistantships and fellowships, research assistantships, teaching assistantships to graduate students at the university. Thank you. Okay, we are going to go to the next. And um, how inclusion and diversity are integrated in your institution? Uh, 
Towson University has been um, working very hard in the last five years to become more diverse. Maryland is a very diverse state and we are trying to emulate the population, um, a sample of the population. So in the last three years, we have brought in uh, probably our most diverse classes um, in the last, from the last 10 years. And um, the interest of international students continues to grow for that reason alone, just diversity to bring students from all over the world. And because of mainly, uh, because of the experiences that they bring to the classroom, just by being from outside the United States. Thank you, Jose, thank you. I think, uh, would you like to add something, Abby? Yeah, and I was just gonna say, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, um, we have a very diverse campus here at Texas Tech. We have over 2,900 international students in over 100 countries represented. So we are a very diverse university. We have a ton of international students that come to us to study for their graduate degree. Um, also, we do have a, a division of diversity, equity, and inclusion office that helps support um, students across campus to strengthen our inclusive communities through diversity, equity, and inclusion. So. Um, we are a very diverse campus and welcome all to Texas Tech University. Thank you. Okay. Um, there were also some questions on the chat, but they have been already answered. Thank you. So we are going to wrap this session up and thank you. Thank you for joining us. This was really useful and I will hand it back to Jenny. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you everyone so much once again for joining us today. This is the first um, of a series of uh, workshops and showcases that we are going to be having. This first one was um, for prospective graduate students. Um, the next one will take place next month in November and will be a showcase for prospective undergraduate students who are interested in pursuing a career in arts and design. So um, um, if you follow us in social media, uh, if you don't, please do it. Uh, we have presence in Twitter. We have a YouTube channel. We are in LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, our different resources and website, uh, Facebook as well. Uh, make sure to follow us so you can uh, learn a little bit more about our different opportunities and our different events. Uh, we do have an advising center uh, that is located at the Benjamin Franklin Library, which is the U.S. Embassy's Library here in Mexico City. Uh, we recently started open um, operations in person, so we are going to have a couple of events uh, during this month of October. Uh, and you will be also receiving the invitation so you can register and participate in those in-person events at our center. Um, and again, uh, you will be uh, getting the resources that were shared uh, during this workshop, during this presentation. And also we will be sharing with you the recording uh, if you want to review uh, all the sessions uh, and the topics given. And again, um, thank you to our higher education institution representatives for being here today. Uh, I hope this was also an opportunity for you to interact and to put the word out there with our uh, students from Mexico about your institutions. I know all of you uh, offer great opportunities for international students and in different programs and different uh, opportunities. Uh, for our audience, if you want to learn more about these institutions, again, make sure to visit their website. Uh, I'm sure you can also do a virtual tour of their, of their uh, campus. Make sure to do that. Those are very fun. Uh, and again, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. We hope this was helpful, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you. Sorry. I thank you so much. Uh, sorry. I have a yes. question. I'm sorry, but... Um... 
Where are we receiving the recording? Via well, email or? Yeah, via email, yeah. Since you registered to this session, we have your contact information and we will be sharing that through email, of course. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Jandi. <laughs> thank you, Maria. And thank you, everyone. We hope you have a good night. <laughs>